Well, again, welcome this morning. It's good to be with you all. It's good. This has been, like I said, seven months now since we opened up the Mill Creek campus last October. This is my first time back with you all. First time there, our Mill Creek campus is joining us this morning through the simulcast. So the first time I've had the opportunity to, to do that as well. And I'm excited for what we have in front of us this morning. I don't know if you heard this story, if you saw this on the news or not. Um, just this last week, I came across a, a story where a 25-year-old man uh, down in Texas was, was um, pretending to be a refugee from Hurricane Harvey, and so he enlisted in a high school as a 17-year-old freshman and joined the basketball team. Um, he won the Offensive Player of the Year in that league, not surprisingly. Um, and, and you look at the story and you just wonder what would compel somebody to, to go through all of that effort. He actually was arrested for filing, filing false documents, go through all of that effort in order to, to be able to go back and, and kind of live in his glory days. Cause, cause we love to, to demonstrate our skills, right? We love, we love to be in an environment or in, in this case, he was literally a man among boys. Um, where he was just dominating on the basketball court because, because he was far more mature and, and, and far more able than those people around him. And, and as a culture, as a whole, we have a tendency to, to place a high degree of value. We celebrate the, the gifted among us. We, we, we create uh, special classes for those who are really, really good at math and science and English, and we call them the gifted students. I, I know very little about those classes. I was never in one of those classes, but I know they existed. We, we take all of our best athletes and we pay them copious amounts of money in order to play for our teams, use their gifts for our teams, so that we're gonna be able to defeat the less gifted teams. And we'll be able to celebrate just how gifted we are or how gifted at least the people we pay to represent us are. We watch our favorite actors, their ability to, to perform and entertain us, their capacity to, to pretend to be someone else. And we give them awards. We acknowledge their giftedness. We even do this, by the way, in the context of the Christian community. We, we create celebrities out of the really, really talented people, the really gifted preacher and the really incredible worship leader get put on larger and larger stages and in front of more and more people. And we follow their Instagrams and we download their podcasts because they're, they are incredibly good at what they do. And, and we celebrate their giftedness. And I'm not I'm not saying that this is a bad thing. I think there are potential pitfalls that come with it, but it's just reality. We, we value the experience of watching someone who is uniquely gifted exercising their gifts. So to be gifted in our culture, we associate that with the, with the idea of being extraordinary. Somebody that is extraordinary, able to do more than the rest of us are able to do. But there are, I think, side effects as it relates to understanding giftedness in this way, particularly as it relates to understanding it this way in the context of the church. And I think of it as, as, as sort of like a, a superhero syndrome, a superhero syndrome, because there's the really extraordinarily gifted people who are out there, and I'm not one of them. And so because I can't, uh, I don't have the ability to make myself invisible and I, I can't fly and I don't shoot lasers out of my eyes, I'm not one of the superheroes. I, I'm one of the ordinary people. And the ordinary people, we just sort of remain in the background watching these incredible people do these incredible things and this extraordinary abilities and, and we're just sort of dependent on them to, to save us from all the impending doom, right? And the, the side effect is that we become spectators. We, 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 we watch the people who are really gifted do what they're really gifted at and, and we sort of become dependent on them. 
So this morning we are beginning a two-week series. Really, it's a part of our Holy Spirit series, our, our nine weeks that we've been talking about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. But this week and next week, we are going to focus together on the spiritual gifts. And I am particularly excited to, to dig in this together as the church. I was thinking as, as I was preparing for this, just how perfect the timing of this is. It relates to where we're at and what's going on in the life of the Mill Creek campus. Over the course of the last seven months, we, we've had new families join us and we have had uh, uh, people come to Christ for the first time in our community. And so studying spiritual gifts together feels like, like just the right thing, the, the, the thing that we need right now to prepare us for this next season of ministry, um, to get us ready for, for more outreach that God's got in front of us and the work that he wants to accomplish. And as I was thinking about all this and getting excited for it and, 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 and having the opportunity to share from 1 Corinthians and to inspire us as to live on mission, I thought that's no less true here. This is no less true for, for you all here at the Kesslinger campus. This is no less true for um, our friends over at South Street this morning. This is really no less true for, for any church that it continues to be on mission, continues to follow the trajectory that Christ left, that he gave us, and that he's given us the Holy Spirit to help us fulfill. So in our time together this morning, what I'd like to do is I'd like to just look at a few questions as it relates to spiritual gifts and how we understand them and how we experience them together and and what are they used for? Um, and, and by the way, just as a bit of a disclaimer, when, when Paul, who does uh, the majority of the writing as it relates to explaining and talking about spiritual gifts in the New Testament, he, he's, he's very overt in it. And, and he's very obvious. And so for our objective this morning, if you're looking for some really in-depth study of some previously unknown thing about the spiritual gifts, that's not what you're going to get. I really want to focus on what Paul says plainly and, and straightforward, and I want us to consider the implications of that. So we're going to talk about what are spiritual gifts, not specifically what are these spiritual gifts. That's actually going to come later next week as you take the assessment. We'll get more into that. Who gives them? Who gets them? And then what is their purpose and why are they given? So let's pray together, and then we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Jesus, as we open up your word this morning, God, I pray that your spirit would give us understanding. Lord, help us again to understand the implications of a spirit who, who empowers and who gives gifts as your church. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. Turn with me to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to look at the first 11 verses here together as Paul writes, actually 12, 13, and 14. All Paul is dealing with a lot here as it relates to spiritual gifts, but I'm going to focus on these verses in chapter 12. This is what Paul writes. He says, now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or the other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them, in every one, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between Spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still to another the interpretation of tongues. And all of these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Now, now a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about how the Spirit indwells us, we were looking at another passage in, 
in 1 Corinthians. And Paul was writing this letter to this church that he planted in the, the city of Corinth. And since the time that he was there with them and now has moved on to the city of Ephesus, he, he's heard back that things aren't going well, that there are some issues that, that he needs to address. And apparently one of those issues, that's, that's his motivation for writing this letter. And apparently one of the issues that he wants to address is, is their understanding of and their application of spiritual gifts. So Paul writes this letter and he says, church, I, I don't want you to be uninformed. And then goes on from there to teach them about the purpose and the use of their spiritual gifts. You see, apparently there were some in, in their community who were equating the ability to exercise certain spiritual gifts, and particularly some of what we think of as the more spectacular spiritual gifts, with a heightened degree of spirituality. That these were the people who were really spiritually mature. And so they're looking at the extraordinary and they're saying, these are the really gifted ones. These are the ones who are the really spiritual ones. And, and Paul's writing into this and he's saying, look, church, I don't want you to be informed. I, I, I want to correct, I want to ground the early church in their understanding and their application of the spiritual gifts. So let's look at that first question together. What what are spiritual gifts? Flip over with me. Like I said, Paul does most of the writing as it relates to spiritual gifts. This is in Ephesians chapter 4. We read this when we did our series uh, in Ephesians, but this is verse 11 through 13. He says, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the teachers, and the pastors to equip the people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So now here, both in, in Corinthians and in Ephesians, Paul's writing in order to help them to understand the purpose, really what, what spiritual gifts are all about. In fact, in, in Corinthians, Again, he's continuing to address this issue that some people are, are making it more about the exercising of the gift than really ultimately what it is that the gift is, is there to do, what its true purpose is. So Paul describes in these verses, and I'm going to suggest a definition. I'll put it up on the screen here as it relates to spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are divine enabled, given by the Holy Spirit to every believer for the purpose of building up the body of Christ. Spiritual gifts are divine enablements given by the Holy Spirit to every believer for the purpose of building up the body of Christ. So let's, let's take a few moments to break down this definition together. First, look at that question of who gives them. Again, Paul's, Paul's clear here back in, in 1 Corinthians. They're given by the Holy Spirit. Verse 4 through 7, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. Different kinds of service, but the same Lord. Different kinds of working in all of them and everyone, it's the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. So Paul is overtly clear here, the, Holy Spirit are, the, the, the spiritual gifts are given to us by the Holy Spirit. In fact, in his explanation of it, he, he uses kind of this Trinitarian explanation. He talks about the Spirit and, and Lord and God who gives us these gifts. These are given to us by God in the person of the Holy Spirit. In fact, he calls them the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Throughout this series, as we've been talking about the role and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we've been thinking about what is it that he does and understanding is this continuation of the work that Jesus began when he was here on earth. And so now Paul's helping us understand in this, in that effort of shaping you and I into be men and women who are more like Jesus, living out his, his kingdom values in this broken world. Now we discover that the Holy Spirit gives these gifts so that we can partner with him for that express purpose. We can partner with him in that work. I, I think of it like this, when I was a kid, at the very, as early as I can remember, and actually my, my mom and dad said as, as early as three, I've always loved tools. 
and I asked at, at three years old for my first set of tools. And my parents went out and like responsible parents got me like a, a set of like Fisher Price hand tools, like this little plastic hammer. And, and they said almost instantly, I was like, I can't work with this, you know, like <laughs> this, is, this is pointless. And so by the time I was five years old, they had gotten me my first set of just some basic hand tools, a hammer and, and a saw, and, and I was constantly working on projects. That was how I had to spend my free time. I'd be out in my backyard and I'd be cutting a board. And if you've ever tried to cut a board with just a basic hand saw, you know that it takes a fair amount of skill and strength that you learn. And as a five-year-old, I, I, I lack some of that. So I would spend just enormous amounts of time just out there trying to make my way through this board. My mom had to love this because I was, you know, I just out there not annoying her for hours. <laughs> and and I would get maybe halfway through or whatever, and, and my dad would come home for lunch, and he would see me out there working on my projects, and I would tell him whatever it is I was trying to do, and, and he would come behind me, and he would put my hand on the saw and stand behind me, and his arm would be next to my arm, and, and he would saw through the board with me. Um, and it was my hand on there doing it, but it was his power. And it was his strength that enabled me to be able to, to finally cut through this board. So this is what Paul is describing to us here as we think about what the Holy Spirit's doing in our lives. And I, this is remarkable to me because I think this is a reflection of how much God loves us, that, that he would choose to include us in his ultimate purpose. Because you and I both know there's times when it's just easier to do it yourself, Right? You know, sometimes as a parent, you're helping with your kids, like, school project or whatever, and you sort of find yourself just taking over. I've seen some of those Pinewood Derby cars, and I know no kid made that, you know? Like, there's no way. But the Holy Spirit, God doesn't do that here. The Holy Spirit gifts us, and he includes us, he uses us in his work. And so he knows that in the context of, of a community like this, there's going to be moments when one of us or many of us need to be encouraged. And he doesn't just say, I'll, I'll take care of that, I'll do that myself. But he gives, he gives some of us the divine ability and enablement to encourage people. And, and he knows that there's going to be ministries that, that need to be launched. And so he sets aside some of us who have this ability, this apostleship ability to launch new ministries. And he knows that as we grow, we're, we're going to need to look at and understand and be taught God's word. And so he gives some of us this ability to teach. He says in verse 11, all these are the work of one and the same spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. So I think that last phrase there, just as he determines, has implications it implies that there's reason and design and purpose behind his distribution of the spiritual gifts. And with that, there's expectations. Like, I, don't, I don't know if you've ever known someone who has an extraordinary gift. Perhaps they're just an incredible artist or an amazing musician or a poet or whatever it is. And but at the same time, they, they, maybe they doubt their giftedness, or maybe there's a certain degree of fear or anxiety, and so they're very reticent to kind of put their work on display. And you're sitting there saying, look, you have to show people this. People, people need to see this. The world is missing out because you're not, you're not showing them this incredible ability that you have. This is, this is what we're seeing. Paul wants us to understand that the world is missing out when we're not using our gifts. The fact that the Holy Spirit gives us gift implies that there's an expectation that we use them. In fact, Paul is very clear in his instructions here to the church. It, it's not okay for you and I to live and act as though we have not been given a gift. We have been called to participate in something greater and he gives us these divine enablements, that, these divine abilities towards that end. That brings us then to the second question. Who gets them? Who gets them? Again, the passage is, is obvious and overt here. Verse 7 of, of 1 Corinthians 12 says, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given 
Verse 11 says, all of these are the work of the same spirit and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Who gets these gifts? You do. We do. We all do. I, uh, I, I, for years, most of my time here at Chapel Street has been in the world of student ministries. So one of the things I loved over the years is taking students on our short-term trips. Um, our, our students are preparing now to leave in just a few weeks to Mexico and Ecuador and, and Milwaukee and Toronto. And, and part of what I loved about those moments is that it created sort of this environment, this greenhouse environment for spiritual growth. And students. There was a certain intensity and, and cultivation, and part of that was that students would discover, they would see firsthand some of their spiritual gifts, how God had wired them. And, and so part of my job and my staff's job, we would walk around and we would see when some student was, was doing something and, and, and perhaps not even necessarily knowing that they were, and come alongside them in the moment and say, did, did you just see what you did? Like, that was, that was perfect. That was, you're the best person on this entire team of people to be able to do that thing. Like, I don't know if you know this, but God has wired you to be able to do that thing. You could see these, these light bulbs going off in students where they were experiencing something perhaps for the very first time and think, wow, God, I didn't know that I was capable of that. I didn't know that I had been given that ability. See, there's no escaping what Paul says to us here. He's saying, if you are a Christian, then you've been given the Holy Spirit. And if you've been given the Holy Spirit, he has gifted you without exception. There, there are, in fact, four primary passages where the spiritual gifts are taught. We looked at, at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 today. If you, chapter 12 through 14 is kind of Paul's whole argument and discourse on this. Ephesians 4, we, we looked at together. Um, there's 1 Peter chapter 4. There's, there's Romans chapter 12. I've looked at all of these. And there is at no point in any of these passages where Paul or Peter place qualifications around the distribution of the gifts. Never. In fact, there's no mention of any qualification. There's no mention of, of a longevity of faith. There's no mention of a certain degree of spiritual maturity that we have to achieve in order to have this. There's no mention of gender or race or social or economic status and all of the typical categories that you and I create in order to disqualify ourselves or to disqualify somebody else, they're never mentioned here, anywhere. In fact, students, high school, middle school students. Hear me on this. You have been gifted as a follower of Jesus to build his church. And this, isn't, this is not a future thing. This is for right now. We as, as the church, we need you to use your gifts, your divine enablements for the betterment of the church. The church is in fact in desperate need of you guys using your gifts right here, right now. Do not wait to a later time. This is for you. And by the way, there's also no retirement age to this. There, there isn't, it's not like, hey, I, I, my kids are out of children's ministry now. I am free, you know, like, it's not there. there. There is no season in life where this does not apply. Who gets the gifts? You do. I, I love the way, and, and Paul describes this here in verses four through six, when he talks about there's different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them, different kinds of service, but the same Lord. He's, he's painting this picture of, of this incredible diversity where God has, has in his wisdom, in his, his foresight, divinely gifted that's coming together towards one purpose, one end. It's diversity in the midst of unity. You've been given your, your spiritual gift. The question that always sort of inevitably comes in the midst of this was, how do I know what my spiritual gift is? Well, towards that end, again, the spiritual assessment that you're going to get this week is, is a helpful tool. It's not, it's not a biblical tool. It's not like an addendum that was on the end of the Bible or anything like that, but it's, it's just people's experience and wisdom over years being put into kind of a survey form that helps us understand how we might be wired. And I can't encourage you enough 
to take the time. It's, it, it, I took it this week. It's probably maybe five to 10 minutes of your time. Um, and you may be surprised, but, but do that. But in my own experience, I, will, I would say that my understanding of my giftedness has been most profoundly understood when in experiences of serving. Um, when I've had the opportunity to be put in a place, oftentimes, especially when I'm understanding it for the first time, someplace I'm uncomfortable. And, and God begins to expose and highlight things that, that are a part of how he wired me that I didn't previously understand. And this is not, by the way, limited to use in the church. God, God has uniquely gifted you for your neighborhood, for your workplace, for your family, for um, your, the sidelines of your kids' soccer team, for whatever it is, your school hallways. He's, he's uniquely gifted you for use outside of these walls as well. Again, we're going to look at this more next week when we talk about how do we know what our gifts are and how should we be using our gifts. But I want to get to this last question this morning, which is what are the gifts for? What are the gifts for? When I was a, a high school student, I too was a basketball player. Um, I, I was not 25. I did it in the, the sort of 14 to 18 range. And um, I was, unlike Pastor Jeff and Pastor Brian, who have like all these incredible stories of, of you know, winning games and all these sorts of things, um, I was always kind of the guy that was good enough to make the team, not really good enough to get into a game. So I watched a lot of sports happen from a very good seat. That's basically like what my career was. And I went to this Christian high school and, and we had, at the end of the season, they would always have this award ceremony. And so you'd get the team together and they would, um, they would have, you know, the MVP or the most, uh, the, the, the person that scored the most points and they'd give all these awards out and, and that sort of thing. And at the end of the day, they would give out what they called the Barnabas Award. Um, which was named after Barnabas in the New Testament, who is the his name means son of encouragement. And so the Barnabas Award was always a little bit of a joke kind of amongst us, because we always sort of knew that it was going to go like to the nice guy sitting on the bench was basically like the subtitle of the Barnabas Award. And I'll tell you, I was a multi Barnabas Award winner, like <laughs> uh, over the course of years. I've got more than one in, in a box and at home. And I always sort of, you know, at the time, joked about that and, and felt like it was kind of a worthless thing. It, it wasn't until much years, uh, many years later that, that I understood that one of my primary spiritual gifts that God had given me was encouragement. Um, matter of fact, some of the times when I've taken assessments and things, it's, it's come up as, as the number one gift that, that God has given me. And that it was way more than being a good sport on, on the bench in a basketball game. It, it had much greater purpose and, and much more application, specifically within this community, within the body of Christ. Look again at, at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. He says, the gifts are given, what he describes as, for the common good. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. He says that to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. See, Paul makes... It clear here that the purpose of the gifts are for our benefit. They are to be used to build up the body of Christ, the church. So you and your spiritual gifts is specifically designed to help me be more like Jesus. Your spiritual gift is specifically designed to help the people sitting around you right now be more like Jesus. See, this, this awareness challenges two of the assumptions that we often make. First is sometimes we think to ourselves, well, I don't, I don't need the church. So we create this version of, of, our, of our faith where we're sort of living it out on our own in isolation and we're going out into the woods and just communing with God. And, and I'm, not, I'm not mocking that. I, I, I think there's actually value in that from time to time, but not in replacement of this. Because if, if we take the theology of spiritual gifts seriously, it, it completely counters that understanding that we can do this on our own. In fact, it's saying that we need each other, we need each other to use our gifts for the benefit of each other. There is designed interdependence here. But it also counters any idea that, any, that pops into our heads that says the church doesn't need me. 
You see, for that same reason, that's not true. You have divine enablements given to you by the Holy Spirit for building up the body of Christ. By that definition, you are incredibly important. Incredibly important in the work that needs to get done here. You are, you are essential in, in helping us fulfill the mission that God has put in front of us for this moment. We need you. And beyond that, I think perhaps greater than that, and that is so important, but I think the gifts are ultimately given to bring glory to Christ. I think the gifts are, are the ultimate result of the use of these in our lives. The Spirit's work in our lives is that Jesus is glorified. This is our purpose as a church. This is the work that he's put in front of us. This is what we have been given, what is set into action. He gets the credit. And what a privilege that is. What, what an incredible privilege that is to be a part of. My prayer is that that would be true here. My prayer is as, 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 as this church continues on, on this mission that's in front of us as we continue to love God and to love our neighbors, that the gifts of the Spirit would be evident here for the purpose of building up the body of Christ and that Jesus would be glorified in it. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you that, that you have surrounded me this morning with people that you have given divine ability to help me become more like you. So God, I pray that you would empower them to use their gifts and that you would empower me to receive them. And may the same be true in reverse. Lord, continue your work here. From, from others, those of us who are just beginning in our faith to those who, who have grown up and have years and years of experience, Lord, empower us with your gifts to build up your church. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Whatever uh, the Holy Spirit burden on my heart. May, I think there's some of you in the room who you have in a sense of what your gifts are and you maybe even have a sense of where God's calling you to use it and you don't want to because it's going to mean something uncomfortable or scary. Maybe fear is limiting you. Um, if that's you this morning, I, I want you to know we have a prayer team in the classroom and back that's available. Of course, I would always am available to pray with you. But if you're wrestling with us, like, oh, Lord, I, I know you've enabled me to do this sort of thing. And I, and I sense that you want me to do it here. I just don't want to. Um, I would love to pray with you this morning. Now receive this morning's benediction. Go now in the name of Jesus Christ, who has left us with his spirit, and his spirit has given us his gifts for your glory and for our benefit. May that be true here, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.